Before I start, I'd like to introduce a few people. Uh, Bob's spouse, Peter Shinto, is here. Mm -hmm. And friends of his, Pat Keck, Mike Ann, Mike Arthur, sitting next to me, and their friend Linda Mountains. Uh, I'd like to take a moment and tell you a little bit about Bob's background. I met Bob many years ago when he was an exhibitor at the uh, PG Museum where they had their antique show the weekend after Thanksgiving. And I have my clocks from Bob. He's prepared clocks for me. And he has quite a background. Uh, Bob has professionally repaired nearly 8,000 timepieces and has sold more than 1,700 vintage clocks and watches. The Silver Star Fellow, one of NAWCC's highest honors of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, he is chairman of its Time Symposium Committee, the organized groundbreaking virology related conference at the Winfrey Museum, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Henry Ford Museum, Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, and assisted in creating the 2019. Time made in Germany International Symposium in Nuremberg. Uh, as a scholar of horology, assisted by a personal library of over 800 books on the subject, he has published more than 100 articles and reviews. More than five years, he wrote detailed catalog descriptions for thousands of antique clocks and watches. He's a livery man of the worshipful company of clockmakers in London. A proprietor of the Boston Afternoon, the soon be a member of the Salem Afternoon, I hope. So. <laughs> Chair number one. <laughs> the exhibit curator for the Homological Society. After graduating from George Washington University in 1973, he worked for 10 years on Capitol Hill in Washington as a speechwriter, legislative assistant, and press secretary for Congressman John Canoides of Detroit. And then for Congressman Shirley Chisholm of Brooklyn. For the next 10 years, he ran ACO, a Lawrence, Massachusetts equipment furniture manufacturing company. Bob has been on the handover of uh, the Lawrence City Planning Board, trustee of the White Fund Gate, the local charitable foundation, and a trustee of the Lawrence Public Library. Welcome to the Sigma Anthony Bob. Thank you, Bill. I have fond memories of you too when you bought all those clocks for me. <laughs> Let me break them again when they started, when they stopped working. I love hearing the introductions because I keep thinking, I want to be that guy. <laughs> How does he get to stand up there? Wait a minute, I actually have that guy. It feels good. I don't know how it happened, except I just kind of kept at it. And I suppose that's, uh, that's the way it's supposed to happen. They work at something long enough and eventually it becomes real. So I'm um, glad it became real. But um, yeah. and certainly I'm happy to be here too. You know, my uh, time at the Boston afternoon has been, uh, has been wonderful. And I think uh, we're not joking about how I should become a, a part of this place too, at least as a, as a member, because uh, even though Salem isn't close enough to end over, you need to move the town a little closer because you can't get there from here, you know, but it's, uh, but when I get here, I enjoy it. So thank you. So uh, uh, one, one of my sort of favorite parts I talked about is sort of how we, uh, how timekeeping uh, and timekeepers developed in New England, but I always try to give it sort of a local, uh, a local cut if I can. So you're going to learn something about sort of the broader picture of the development of how we knew what time it was and why we cared about it. Uh, but there'll be some sound specific information here too that I think will be fun, including the, uh, the watch paper that you see in my opening uh, image there. And we'll talk more about what these are and uh, who this guy was, but uh, it's fun to have uh, you know, actual physical, uh, physical things from those periods of time too. Uh, my business is Bell Time Clocks uh, some 30 some years ago when I was trying to think of the name. Uh, for my clock repair business that I was starting. Uh, I had just purchased this um, Harper's Weekly engraving by Mitchell Homer uh, called Bell Time, and it's a view of the mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where I was living at the time. So it uh, sort of dawned on me that the Bell Time clock should be, uh, should be the name of the business. Uh, and it's, uh, there's no 
bell. There's no uh, clock in this room, but you see a tower there that had a bell in it. And then this uh, went to a Homer engraving illustration accompanied an article that spoke about how uh, already at this time, and certainly in mill towns, people were living and, and breathing and working by the bell, by the clock. Uh, in Lawrence, for example, there were three bells when the mills were beginning their daytime shift. And if you weren't there by the third bell, the gate had shut and you'd lost the day's work. So uh, uh, these people were you know, rushing back and forth to go uh, to work in those mills along the Merrimack River, which you can see uh, uh, see there as well. The, uh, uh, the question I often ask, even though, of course, I know the answer, is how many uh, clocks and watches were on the Mayflower? And the answer is zero because uh, portable timekeeping really didn't exist in the way that was accurate enough. So when they got on this boat, they were not, uh, they didn't bring clocks and watches with them. They didn't have them, they were too expensive. There was no point in having them. And they told time in other ways, including by sand glasses. And these were kept carried on most ships. We'll say they were half hour duration so that um, uh, the helmsman would have this. He was steering the ship and he would turn it over when all the sand was gone. However, if it was cold, rainy, and no one was looking, he turned it over a little bit early so he could go back to bed. And that was called eating sand. And eventually, if he did that often enough, he would reverse day and night on the ship. So it, was a, it wasn't a good thing, but especially if it was foggy or bad weather, and they couldn't uh, regain the right time by setting the sun, uh, that happened uh, periodically. But also on these ships, uh, and the bells would ring. Some of you maybe have a Chelsea clock that rings ship bells, or you were in the Navy, perhaps. Uh, so there's a period from one to eight every four hours when the bells ring. This is, again, a Winslow Homer that some of you may recognize. Uh, uh, where the guy is uh, it's, uh, uh, announcing uh, whatever the time is on the ship. The um, mechanical timekeeping, things that actually tick, started, uh, uh, we think, in the 13th century. It was mostly related with monasteries and churches, monasteries particularly, perhaps in the northern Italy, southern Germany, uh, where there were you know, religious uh, orders that required frequent and regular prayer sessions, even during the night. So um, uh, before they had a candle that might burn down with lines on it, and some poor monk was waiting up looking for the line and maybe ring the bell, and monks would have to get up and pray and pray they could get back to bed soon. So it was, uh, um, or else there were sand glasses, or else water clocks, perhaps, the ticking time pieces. They were already geared machines, but something that ticked uh, that actually could tell time. Uh, was developed around that time. And the word clock derives from a, a Latin for bell because originally they just rang the bell with no face. But then they were started to be in churches. The oldest known uh, uh, tower clock was in Salisbury Cathedral that you're seeing here. And there's the giant, uh, the big iron machine, which no longer keeps time in the tower, but they still have. And this is the oldest known uh, clock movement. Uh, in, in Western Europe, anyway, that uh, would keep the time. And there weren't clock makers back then. These were made by itinerant uh, uh, guys who could make them or to our blacksmiths or metal workers of some sort. Not particularly reliable, but it was, uh, it was an important thing for early cities to have. And eventually, every town and city wanted to have a, a tower clock, an important town clock, to also kind of help regulate society. So we're seeing uh, this tower at Westminster uh, on the opening day in uh, 1859, I should say. Um, let's see, I know because so this is being recorded, and everyone will call me up if I get it wrong. 18, yes, 1859 was the first day when this started to strike. And I'm sure you're all saying, hey, that's Big Ben. But no, this is Big Ben. Big Ben is the bell that's in the tower. Uh, it's not uh, officially the name of the tower or the clock, it's the bell. And it was named after you know, the, the founder of the bell, and, uh, and it rang the hour note. And you see the other bells up there, which would ring the Westminster chime that uh, we're all familiar with from our dual bells and chime and clocks uh, that would ring the other notes every quarter hour. But uh, as we start to see the development of towns like Salem that we're seeing from, I believe this is uh, the Alvin uh, Fisher uh, painting of, uh, of, of a view of Salem. 
Uh, yeah, 1818 uh, from uh, Gallo Hill. I think I've never been to Gallo Hill. Maybe I don't want to go there. But uh, so this is good. So we're already starting to see church towers, and at least one of them, if not more of them, there was a clock. They started to get to the problem where if there was more than one, uh, they would be dueling ones, so they weren't always striking at the same time. Uh, so you had to say if you were going to meet, you know, your friend for lunch, it might be I'll meet at noon by, you know, Saint Ignatius at Bell, you know, instead of you know that some other church. If you ended up with too many of them in the town, so uh, this is an illustration of uh, Salem's first meeting house, and uh, uh, obviously there was a clock in it too. I just found this image recently when I was looking for Salem related things. And um, this, interestingly enough, has a diamond shaped dial, which was uncommon. Uh, mostly they were round or, or square. Uh, but it's interesting because uh, there's another, another clock that also has a diamond dial. This is the famous Paul Revere engraving of the Boston Massacre. And you see on the old brick church back there, uh, there's a diamond dial uh, in addition to a building mounted sundial. And I'll show you the detail of that. In a minute, but I also want to make the point that, uh, uh, and some of you may know that this was a propaganda piece. The Boston Massacre did not happen like Paul Revere uh, depicted it. Uh, and in fact, John Adams was the uh, uh, was the attorney for the uh, British soldiers who were accused of murder. He got all of them off basically uh, because uh, they were provoked and attacked uh, by the by the group of uh, patriots we call them now, even though they were rebels back then. So it didn't happen that way. But the other interesting thing is that Paul Revere got the time wrong on the clock. It was not the time of the, of the Boston Massacre. He added off by two hours. So it was actually two early versions of this print. The first one with the time wrong and the second one a couple of weeks later where he corrected the time in the dial. A few other uh, people did it as well. But here's a close-up. So you see that uh, that time shape dial. And also this with the twofer because on the front of this old state house was a building mounted sundial. And it was sundials that really enabled us to know really what time it was and to correct and adjust our ticking clocks because we had no GPS, no radio, no uh, nothing else that was a time standard except the sun that was passing overhead. So there were many sundials around, including uh, building mounted ones uh, like you see here. And often too, they were in gardens and uh, even in people's pockets. But um, this is at Beauport. I'm sure not many, if not all of you, have been to the lovely uh, historic house of Beauport. And this is the sundial. You can see you know, when the sun is shining, the melon casts are pretty sharp shadows. You can be uh, pretty closely attuned to what time it was and then adjust your clock. This is also, uh, as you see, this is a Salem sundial. This was uh, owned by Governor John Endicott, our first uh, uh, colonial governor here. And the thing with sundials is they have to be made and calibrated for your latitude. So this uh, shows the latitude here and also shows that it was made for Salem because if you use this in another place with a different latitude, it is not really correct. But it's great to have this. This is in the PBS Museum. Uh, collection, and if you have the alarm code and the key, I'd like to go ahead and take this. So, uh, I'll talk to you afterwards. If you know that. Uh, the thing with uh, sundials, however, is that uh, the sun is not accurate. The sun uh, uh, varies uh, uh, only four times a year is it clock time. The rest of the year can vary by up to 18 minutes. So you need an equation, a timetable, which tells you each day of the year whether you add or subtract time from the sundial to adjust your clock. And these were commonly used in uh, uh, the equation of time thing, might be inside your back while the clock might be in a little piece of paper. This one, as in many of them, was in an almanac, and this was in Franklin's for Richard's uh, almanac uh, for that particular year. And everybody would be consulting this if they were trying to set their clocks and watches based on their sundial. So there's uh, a nice picture of Ben Franklin. This is uh, uh, by David Martin, 1767. And the reason I'm showing this is because uh, Franklin designed our first colonial currency. You see, this is 1776. This is a Fujio dollar, they're sometimes called, because this is uh, basically saying time flies. But he has the uh, iconography, the imagery of the sundial here with the sun shining down on it. And the sundial was also kind of an image of of work and how we should work. And that's why he says, mind your business. He's not saying mind your own business. He's not saying don't be nosy. He's saying get to work, do your business because we have a 
country to build. We have a, a word of wind against Britain, so everybody needs to buckle down. And when the sun's shining on that sundial, we should be out there doing something productive. So, uh, you know, that, that imagery of, of clocks sort of representing discipline and, and hard work and all uh, certainly was in use in this case here, too. And as I mentioned, almanacs, you know, a lot of people used almanacs uh, for calendar indications. And also, as you see, uh, they would note when the eclipses were each year. And this is sort of timely since we just had a, a rare full lunar eclipse just a night or two ago. So but this would tell you that in that too. So this would have added weight in the time chart and, and told you many other things about the, about the calendar and what happened on various days during the year. Uh, this is not me. This is uh, Galileo, who's been with uh, I've been told I look exactly like him. So, uh, uh, but I mentioned him because uh, when he was sitting in the uh, in the cathedral at Pisa, and you see I'm not lying, there's the tower. Uh, he, he was uh, perhaps bored by the sermon. And he was watching a lantern swing uh, from a chain or a rope inside. And he noticed that as it swung back and forth, no matter how widely back and forth it swung because of drafts or something, it was always coming back and forth at the same rate. And he was timing it with his pulse. So he realized that that this this was could be applied to timekeeping. And he was the first to suggest that a pendulum on a clock. Uh, could make it much more accurate, and he never lived long enough to uh, to create one based on his design. Uh, but it later was made. His son worked on it, and and, uh, and he had the concept of assigning a pendulum to a clock, which then, in the mid 1600s, by a Dutch guy, uh, began to apply the clocks, and they became a hundred times more accurate because, like the one we saw. In the software cathedral, maybe within 15, 30 minutes a day accuracy, just because the way it was taking wasn't very accurate. But once you apply a pendulum, you can get much more accurate. And that's what you see inside, you know, all the grandfather clocks around the nice ones standing out in the hall there all have this pendulum. And if the pendulum is about three feet long, it's called a royal pendulum, and its period of going back and forth is once a second. Every tick is exactly a second. Because the shorter the pendulum, the faster it goes. It's the longer it is, the slower it goes. So if one is about three feet long, every time it goes back and forth, it's a second each time. So it makes it very convenient to put a second scan on the base of the clock because you don't have to put any extra gears in there to make it read seconds. So in addition to town clocks, which were uh, you know, in Salem and Andover, where it was up there, people could start in knowing when to meet each other. When church was starting, if the bells were ringing like crazy, the town was on fire, but the Native Americans were coming over the hill. Uh, but normally, it was just announcing the time, and the bell could certainly be heard much farther away than the face of the clock could be read. So it's important to have a bell up in that tower as well. But also, People started to have clocks in their homes as well, and uh, and that was a sign of sophistication of that. Once, if you're rich enough to have a tall clock in your house, then uh, uh, it showed. And if there was a painting of the family like this one, and there was a clock in it, right away people could read the painting and know that uh, this was a family that had a certain level of affluence and sophistication. This is a painting that's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's by Robert Peckham in um, the early 1800s, 1817. And it's actually a painting of his family in Bolton, Massachusetts, not too far from here. But this is one of those paintings that's actually a posthumous painting because little Elizabeth here had died about three months before the painting was done. And it wasn't unusual for paintings to be made that included dead people in them to show that they were still a part of the family, they were being remembered, and they were still involved in the family, even if their physical presence uh, was no longer there. So again, little Elizabeth had died, and that's why this is not a particularly joyful looking scene, even though it's sort of a party, uh, but if people don't look very happy, they're still mourning a uh, little girl's death. Uh, this is also a familiar scene, perhaps not joyful as well. This is obviously it's a painting of a Salem witch examination. Uh, and you see that there's a clock in there as well. I guess, again, to sort of indicate that, you know, there's a serious thing in some ways where there's a clock in the room, which was kind of governing things. I mean, look more closely at the clock. And it's an interesting design, and I could only find uh, one other in one of my reference books that actually has a sort of top and a round dial as opposed to a square or a rectangular dial with an arch in the top. So it's interesting that that 
kind of clock up here, and uh, they find this one example of an English maker that sort of had that same kind of clock and a round diamond. But and it was interesting, and then, you know, sometimes you don't know if that was a real clock that the artist knew of and sort of copied, or whether they were just uh, using a little poetic license because the artistic license because it was not a typical uh, form of a clock. And I've kind of danced around what I call those four standing clocks. I'm not sure what happened there. All right, well, no, that's fine. I just didn't want to be arguing with myself. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So I, before I interrupted myself, I was saying how nobody called those clocks grandfather clocks until this song came along at around the time of the 1876 centennial uh, called grandfather's clock so maybe you may remember this uh, when the old man died uh, the clock stopped never run again but before that they were called just the clock or perhaps an eight day clock meaning it was a standing clock that you only had to wind once a week instead of another kind of clock that needed daily winding or maybe you know floor clock a hall clock but after that, then they start to be called grandfather clocks, and uh, and obviously that's what uh, people have called them ever since. Uh, one of the principal makers of uh, of grandfather clocks in England was Simon Willard. Uh, he also invented the banjo clock. Uh, there's one on the wall there too, which I like to see. So um, and this was an innovation because before that you either had the big standing grandfather clocks. Or you had also quite expensive uh, smaller bracket clocks, macro clocks, uh, that most people could not afford either. So the banjo clock was a way to make an eight day weekly winding clock that was smaller and more affordable. And Simon Willard was the inventor of that. He patented it. Everybody copied it immediately, so his patent wasn't well enforced. Uh, but there's a lot of banjo clocks with it. And this isn't a talk for gearheads, so I'm not going to talk all about how clocks work, but you might want to see the nice little machine that's inside of the banjo clock, and this is what the parts look like. So it looks like it's fairly simple, it's not that many parts, but you know, you still have to make a wheel like this, and if this wheel has 48 teeth, and you make it with 46 teeth, then you have something to tips but doesn't dump down. So you know, there's specific things that have to be done correctly in order for this to not just be a ticking machine, but actually it's all the time. Uh, the Willard family, again, was probably the most famous family of clock making. Uh, clock makers in New England, if not the country. And this is the Willard House and Clock Museum. It's in Grafton, Mass, which I encourage you all to go to. It's full, uh, it has the largest collection of Willard clocks anywhere in the world, more than 60 of them, I think. And a great place to visit is right out by the Tufts uh, Veterinary School as well, beautiful part of the country to go look at. Uh, this serious looking guy is um, Eli Terry because he was really the guy that started the American Industrial Revolution and mass production uh, techniques. He was commissioned to uh, to to um, to make four thousand grandfather clock movements in three years. And before that, clockmakers could make five, ten clocks a year if they were lucky. But he had the idea of harnessing water power and creating machinery that would very quickly make all the parts and make them interchangeable. And that really was the beginning again of the whole industrial revolution in America. And this was all in Connecticut and all those uh, machine shops and people that were creating clocks started to create other things. Um, a lot of the uh, firearms enthusiasts claimed it was Eli Whitney who did began interchangeable parts in America. But his pistols that he kept um, uh, getting additional subsidies and more and more contracts from the federal government because he claimed he was mass producing them. His pistols were never really interchangeable or mass produced until long after he left Terry uh, was producing clocks in his Ireland uh, factory, which was part of Plymouth, and Plymouth Center in, uh, in Connecticut, uh, where he was producing clocks by the tens of thousands. And one of the earliest designs was this uh, clock called the Pillar and Scroll Clock. Uh, which uh, had weights that descended inside and had an outer movement made almost entirely of wood. 
because the um, brass was expensive. The British didn't want us making brass here. They made it expensive. And we looked around and we said, well, we got a ton of the here, uh, which was wood. So they could make it for which they didn't travel very well in the ocean. We were selling them uh, domestically. They, they made tens of thousands of them. They were affordable and expensive. And you see, again, most of the parts are wood, except you know, uh, the escape wheel up there. But that's very fine key, which you could really make out of wood. And they figured out which woods to use. Cherry was a good wood. Oak was good. Uh, laurel wood for some of the chefs. And um, they made them well. And these were also like peddlers. You can see a clock in the back there. So the peddler would go house to house, town, town to town with his load of clocks. And uh, a typical way he would work is that he would leave the clock kind of on approval uh, on the mantle in some farmhouse. And, you know, of course, you know, the, Particularly, the farm wife was very excited about having this modern uh, device on the on the uh, on the mantle that made her look sophisticated and make the house look nice. And they hear the bell ring every hour. So when the uh, uh, clockmaker came back in a few months to say, you know, do you want the clock or not? You know. There was no way that clock was leaving the house. So uh, it, uh, it was a very successful sales technique. And uh, that's why you know, almost every house in New England ended up with one of these clocks eventually. Uh, again, wooden movement clocks had the problems. In the late 1830s, there was a very serious economic downturn. Most of the wooden movement clock businesses went out of business. Uh, but then, uh, uh, and then the Chauncey Jerome, he claims in a dream thought of how to make an inexpensive brass clock. This is an OG case, it's called because of the shape of the movement. And inside, it's an inexpensive, but much more reliable, but also mass produced brass clock. And they always had these openings in the dial, so your neighbors would know that you didn't have one of those old crappy wooden clocks. If you had a brass movement in your clock, and you could actually see it ticking inside. So these became popular again. There's tens of thousands of these left. You can buy them five at a time at auction for hundred dollars still, you know, even, even though they're very old. So uh, is that once we figured out how to make making springs too, which was important because these were weight driven clocks and making a spring that didn't explode or break or kept its tension was tricky. But once in the 1840s and 50s, we figured out how to make those inexpensively. Then we could make even smaller clocks like this uh, sharp gothic. Some of you may have already said, oh, that's a steeple clock. But it's the same thing. They weren't called steeple clocks until much later. They were called the shot gothics. And one of my uh, favorite horology of Martin images uh, is this uh, the steeple clock or sharp gothic. This game is also the theme by Harrison Boston. It's a great folk art painting. And this, uh, you can see the artist had a little problem with perceptions. Is that <laughs> perspective, I guess I should say here? Because I don't think that chip was really that big. <laughs> but the fact that it's small. Uh, but anyway, I love it for many reasons, uh, including the fact that there's a steeple clock on the wall uh, behind it, too. It became uh, even more popular. There are, you know, for obvious reasons, called black metal clocks. They were imitating French marble clocks, which were about 10 times more expensive, but looked a lot like this. So by the end of the night of the 1800s, every home that didn't already have a clock started to have black mantle clocks like this. And we see that they became important parts of the family to the extent where we see where this woman uh, and her two kids are fleeing the Great Fire of Salem in 1914. Um, this is a photo from that time, and um, you see that she's rescued the clock, maybe a few other things. She's got two kids. I assume she didn't have a third kid. She left behind not to bring the clock instead. But, um, but anyway, and if you don't remember or believe how bad the fire of 1914 was, this is Salem after that fire. So uh, I'm not sure where the afternoon was. Uh, maybe somebody here knows uh, uh, whether it burnt down to or if this building, I think this building precedes it, right? So, yeah, so the fire didn't get up this far, but uh, uh, obviously there were a lot of things that uh, burnt up and probably some of those black mantle clocks that weren't saved uh, on the way up. So that's kind of a scary picture probably for, for anybody here. You probably remember that fire bill, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're just a boy. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Uh, another place where uh, we talked about uh, uh, that about um, shipboard uh, time telling, and that was that became important when you were crossing the ocean if you're trying to determine your latitude and longitude. So this again, another missile Homer seemed to be stuck on Homer. 
Uh, but this is a wonderful one called Eight Bells. It's at the Anderson Gallery of Art in Montana and Andover. So this is showing you taking the new site and then also uh, uh, coordinating it with the timekeeping to determine their longitude because that was very difficult to determine. You needed an accurate timekeeper. If you were just, you know, taking the steamboat between Massachusetts and Rhode Island, you were inside of land and it wasn't that important uh, to know where you were because you could use uh, uh, landmarks that you could see from the ship in order to get there. But if you were out of sight of land, a lot of times you ended up in a bad situation because you could be tens or hundreds of miles off if you weren't able to determine where you were. So this is a book which probably a lot of you have read, I hope it's in the library here, uh, tells the story of how John Harrison in England in the 18th century proved that accurate enough timekeeping could be developed on shipboard and that you could then use it to determine your longitude within five or ten miles uh, of where you were, which uh, meant that you, if you headed to, to Boston Harbor, you weren't going to end up in Richmond. So it was, uh, it was an important uh, uh, important development. And eventually, the, when Harrison device turned into marine chronometers, which the, these were made and these were carried by the early 1800s, most ships had them. This is an interesting one because it was made in Boston by way of Bond. Mostly they were made in England and France, but this is a good one. They, were, they had to be accurate within seconds a month, or they were useless. They, they didn't have to keep perfect time. They just had to be perfectly inaccurate. So they were rated before they went out on the shipboard. You get a whole chart that said this this chronometer loses 14 seconds a month. And then when the captain was determining his position, he would factor that into his into his mathematics to determine his longitude. So again, they didn't keep perfect time, but they kept perfect, imperfect time, and that was uh, that was all they needed to do. This is another marine chronometer that looks a little worse to where you see it was made in Liverpool, and that's because this chronometer was on this boat. And so, and so um, as you know, some things the, the wreck was discovered, some things were uh, were retrieved from the wreck, including that uh, chronometer there, which obviously chronometers didn't have iceberg warnings built into them. But all you know what time it was and what time your ship went down, because that's what time the clock stopped at. And that was uh, um, that was uh, a different story. Another place where timekeeping became important in America was in the, during the Civil War. It was kind of the first time that average soldiers uh, could afford watches. This is a great early book photograph of a regular soldier, and he's proudly displaying his watch. Almost certainly, it was a wall cam made right down the road, the American Watch Company. This was the first company that uh, began using the same mass production techniques that Eli Terry had done earlier with clocks, but of course on a much smaller scale. But before that, watches, they were handmade, they were handmade by specialists who would make only one part and somebody would put it together. But they often had to develop machinery they could produce these parts perfectly in great numbers and made reliable, affordable uh, watches happen at that time. There's an early view of the Walton factory. The building still exists, it's here. Uh, it's no longer a factory, it has offices and condos, but there's a nice little museum on the first floor you can visit that tells the story of the Walton factory. And there's a view of inside in 1893, and you see that most of the employees here are women. Uh, it was one of the best jobs uh, in America that women can have because they, for the same jobs, they were paid equally with the men, uh, and they were uh, uh, doing you know, very skilled work, too. You see, of course, the supervisor is a man over there doing nothing while they're all working. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this is a kind of a view of the way the factory needed to be with a lot of light, uh, narrow areas, and these women would sit at the benches and mostly, in this case, probably assembling because the machinery uh, was somewhere else in the building and cranking out all these parts, and a lot of that machinery was run by men. But the women were doing uh, this type of work, and they were producing watches like this. This is called a railroad gray watch or railroad watch, uh, and that story was important too because uh, as railroads became more and more active. Uh, uh, you needed accurate timekeeping, not just for the scheduling, uh, but to keep them running smoothly. You see at the beginning of the Fall River line, uh, you know, between the, you know, maybe one was leaving at seven and three. So they didn't have to worry about trains passing and these were single track lines. So if they were coming in opposite directions, one had to get off on a siding so the other train could pass. 
as things start to get a little busier here, the boss and the main, see there's more training going back and forth. Maybe, you know, the timing needed to be a little bit more. This is still 1846, but occasionally somebody's watch didn't work and you ended up with a lot of expensive scrap notes on the track. Uh, and they really didn't like that happening. So they developed standards for very high, very high accuracy pocket watches uh, that were inspected regularly, uh, could have to be serviced regularly, and very strict uh, uh, um, characteristics for their accuracy so that these kinds of wrecks would not happen. The uh, uh, At railroad stations and other public buildings like this, there would be these regulator clocks uh, this was a set Thomas extra number one from the 1880s. And I bought this clock from under a guy's bed here in Salem. And the fun thing, which I didn't really know I mean, you know, that is kind of fun thing on top, but I discovered that uh, the Young Men's Union was a Catholic fraternal organization in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, what the young, what the uh, lady friends did, I don't know, maybe some did uh, tell me, uh, but they obviously liked the guys enough to buy them a clock for their clubhouse, and, uh, and there's uh, the Young Men's Union, so I have this hanging in my house now, really should be back in Salem somewhere eventually. I don't think the Young Men's Union exists anymore, but I did find a little card recently on eBay uh, from the Young Men's Union, you see they're announcing that they're having a, a literary exercise uh, at their building uh, on this Monday night. The fun thing too is that this is signed by George and Whipple, who uh, you may recognize as a famous name in Salem. This is a picture of George and Whipple uh, a little bit earlier when he was in the Civil War. And uh, railroads were running on local time until uh, standard time came about in the 1880s, which meant that scheduling was a nightmare because every town had its own noon and had its own local time. When the sun was overhead at noon, that was the time in Salem. And if you went from Salem to Worcester or Salem to Albany, uh, you know, the time was different by many, many minutes. And the railroad schedules were you know, the size of the Manhattan and Boat Road because uh, there were just everybody ran on their same schedule. And you had to have clocks like this to show local time and railroad time. It was all very confusing until 1883 when we had the day of two noons, uh, where finally standard time zones were established in America. Four time zones going across. A lot of people were mad about this. They said, by God, you know, Salem, my God, put the noon, uh, put the sun straight above in Salem. We don't care what the railroad people say. Uh, but obviously, it made a lot of sense to uh, have people at least in a time zone on the same schedule so they weren't crashing the trains and, uh, and missing their trains as they did that. So we can look a little more closely at Salem, and we always think, gee, you know, I wonder whether that many watchmakers and clockmakers in Salem. This is a partial list going up to about 1850. Uh, I didn't show you the next page, uh, but there were a lot of people, and it's because everybody had clocks and watches, and everybody's clocks and watches woke a lot or stopped working a lot because it was dirty. You know, we, had, we didn't have paved streets, all that dust was rising. We had smoky fireplaces. We had people, you know, dropping their watches all the time. They needed to be cleaned every year or two or three, and you needed a lot of watchmakers and clockmakers uh, to do that work. So some of the local makers, um, Samuel Mulligan has a great uh, talk clock uh, by Samuel Mulligan. I was in the process of working on a book about all of the Mulligan family of clockmakers. They are a very important family in New England. Mostly Massachusetts clockmakers, but there's a Samuel Mulligan. Uh, that's the movement that's in a Samuel Mulligan clock. You see, it's kind of like a, a bigger version of the uh, uh, banjo clock movement I showed you before. Uh, there are the parts of that, more parts, because this is a striking clock. The banjo clock only tells time. There's no longing on the hour. This has two machines, really. One of them does the striking of the bell, the other does the ticking. So there's a lot of parts there, and I actually know what each part does and how to put them back together again. So uh, that took 10 years of training, but now I know which goes where. Uh, and um, Samuel Mulligan also made these dwarf clocks like this, sometimes called grandmother clocks too. This one's just right down the street at the uh, at the Peabody Essex Museum. And this one is also by Samuel, uh, Samuel Mulligan, made in Sam. So it's a big clock here. At some point, I hope they'll find another second hand to put in there. It's not a sad thing. Just let it sit there with a part missing on the face. But uh, 
kind of a little air, so I guess they can do what they want with it. Uh, here's an ad by Samuel Mulligan uh, when he was uh, when he was in Salem, and you see that uh, he's doing you know a lot of a lot of uh, Oh, and you see these right here on the record fences meeting house there too. Uh, so these guys were making many clocks because they were expensive. You could still buy cheap ones to everyone. So if you wanted a big top clock and they were uh, they were expensive and mostly he was repairing clocks and watches too. So that was the basis of most of the film. But you see he's also uh, uh, he's selling other clocks and he's also uh, uh, hoping to order uh, stuff for clocks too. There was a Joseph Mulligan too, uh, a relative of his that was also in Salem. And you see that he's also advertising in 1793 uh, for things that he's uh, selling and repairing and also warranted jacks. These aren't the things you bounce the ball and play with. These were uh, roasting jacks, which were used to turn the meat in front of the fire. So you see one here mounted on the wall above the fireplace. So if you would trim the weight would descend, uh, this would turn, it would come down here and it would rotate the spit. Because otherwise, that was a horrible job for the wife, for the son, or, or servant to have to be there getting their eyebrows burnt off, you know, while they're trying to turn that chicken so it doesn't get, you know, black on one side and raw on the other. So this were great machines. They were expensive, so not everybody had them, but that's what uh, Joseph Mullerton was uh, was talking about selling. Another famous maker here is Edmund Courier, a uh, great clock of his. It's also at the PBS 16. You see the beautifully uh, uh, decorated face of that one. Uh, there's an Edmund Courier uh, lyre banjo clock, L-Y-R-E, and sort of in the shape of their musical instruments. So that's also uh, hanging at the PB at the PB Essex Museum. And in Beauport, uh, um, which I mentioned earlier with the sundial, there's also a career of wire band and club in Beauport as well. And there's a close up of the uh, glass showing that it was made when uh, Courier and Foster were teamed up in Salem, uh, making beautiful clocks in addition to, uh, to servicing people's clocks as well. And here's another, uh, another one that was sold at auction, uh, also by Courier and Foster, another wire band of clock. And you see that these are not inexpensive. So if you see one at a yard sale for ten or fifteen dollars, maybe you should grab it while you can, and uh, we'll explain later. So, uh, uh, so the, there's there's some of these around. This is also this is a wooden front banjo, which were less common, but uh, some people prefer them. Others, some of those uh, painted ones are a little too gold and flashy, so these are a little more understated. Uh, this was sold in scanner, and you see this was the label. Uh, that we can be made inside. It's nice when these labels are still there. Sometimes, of course, they fall off or dry up in their mind. Uh, but when they're still in there, you know, you get a lot of good information in addition to who made the clock. And you see it's a uh, uh, Derby Square. There's there still a Derby Square here. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know what's at number 11 now, but the uh, Curry uh, used to be there. And this is a great thing that I found recently, too, because see, that good Curry, a lot of his papers are up at the New Hampshire Historical Society in Concord. And they have this certificate of Edmund Courier being a member of the uh, Salem Charitable Mechanics Association. These are organizations of, uh, of, uh, that were designed to foster the education of uh, young people who wanted to go into the trades so that they would have a nice school there and set up the apprenticeships. Uh, to help people get into the trades, which were important for every city and town, to make sure they had an adequate supply of people to fix things and make things. This is a great thing. The other thing that I found here, too, in the small print, was this was designed by a famous artist in Boston called John Rito Penniman, who also uh, uh, painted clock dials and clock glasses. But uh, it was worth looking at the fine print there because I saw that that was a pen in the day. And the career, of course, died like uh, every, everybody did back then. And he, uh, uh, you see that uh, the uh, remnant of his stock uh, is being sold at auction. And you see the kinds of things that he still had left over, including a lot of these uh, tools, which were necessary for the, uh, uh, for the production of clocks and watches. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that option. I would have liked the very low prices promised uh, by there. So uh, you saw this on the title page. This is a watch paper. Uh, so this would put inside the lid of the watch so that there are one of the covers. So this would serve to help keep dust out. Uh, so that function, but it also showed who either serves the clock or sold the clock. And sometimes there's stacks of them inside, so you can peel away one and see one that it needs. So it's great if you buy or find 
the little pocket watch and find the watch paper. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's exciting to see that. And they usually do nicely uh, engraved prints that are interesting to see. So here's another uh, clock maker from our uh, repair, I guess, from the time in Washington Square. I found this in a clock that I was servicing, Charles Lamson. And of course, we know Danny Below. This is one of his hair. Uh, catalogs from a while ago. Uh, of course, uh, yeah, this side the building is still there where he was located. I've serviced many clocks and watches that uh, have his name on the dial. He wasn't making them there, he was uh, retailing them there. This is an example of one of uh, Daniel Lowe and a company uh, uh, pocket watch made by Waltham. That if you ordered enough of them, if you were a jewelry store, um, you could get your name on the dial too, and often on the movement as well. Uh, we're almost at the end, but this is a great thing. I can't find anything more about WK Haas, but this is a half of a stereo view uh, from Salem. So I think this guy was here, and there were crazy guys periodically who would make these monumental clocks, you know, that did everything. They would spend, you know, every night for 40 years, you know, making something that, you know, the the uh, planets turned and figures popped in and out, the music played and everything. So, uh, and this one doesn't exist anymore. A few of them are still left, you know, after they went to Barnes and people found them before the mice ate them all. Uh, but uh, this is a great image, and someday I hope to find out more about the about Mr. Boz. And maybe if this is in somebody's garage down the street, uh, you should let us know because we'd be happy to, to learn more about it too. One of my other talks, and you've probably seen some of uh, some of the examples already, is horology. Now I look for uh, for fine art paintings going back to the beginning of ticking time. Uh, in the 1300s, and I have more than 2,000 art images now of, uh, of fine art images with clocks that have you know, Rembrandt, uh, Father from Rembrandt, to Jamie Wyeth, and uh, my symposium at, uh, at the MFA in 2017 was on that subject. I had speakers from all around the world who came and spoke about art with clocks and watches in them. And you know, these aren't selfies or snapshots. Either. The clocks and watches were in there for a reason. They were to show again that the person was sophisticated or disciplined, or once in a while what time it was, but that really wasn't that important. That's Paul Revere discovered with his uh, with his great planet print of the Boston Massacre. Uh, but they were in there, and again, I'd be happy to return at some point and uh, and show you a lot of eye candy of a uh, fine art that has them in it too. So one of the ones I usually conclude with. Is it, this is a painting uh, um, by Jerome Thompson. It was painted in 1858. And this is a group at the top of Mount Mansfield, which is the tallest mountain in Vermont. And you see this climbing party is up and up there, but you see it's starting to get a little bit late. So there's a detail of their painting. And this guy is holding up his pocket watch and saying, uh, by the way, I don't know if you want to go down the mountain in the dark. So maybe, uh, maybe we should get going now. And that's my cue to uh, get going as well. And I appreciate your listening. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk a few minutes about what's on the table. I so see two folks have brought clocks here too. What I also brought, I'm um, still, so let me know if you can still hear me. Uh, this is an actual an example of a, of a probably late 1700s grandfather clock movement, like what's uh, out in the hall there and what I showed you before. And this is an example of one of those wooden movements. Uh, this came out of uh, uh, Connecticut uh, uh, clock from the 1820s, probably. You see that these are uh, all years in this. You know, if this were hooked up to a week, this would do and work still to this day. So uh, there's still tens of thousands of these uh, left in the world. Uh, because, uh, you know, they were well made and people wanted to keep them sometimes a year or two breaks, it's wood, and then I do my dental work, you know, where I replace the tooth with a little piece of wood. But, um, you know, they're kind of incredibly uh, amazing that they last that long. So, a package to see, chocolate came along. This I peeked in before because the face of the clock uh, has the uh, retailer name on it. Uh, let's see if it's I yeah. yeah, this is Street Crown Glow. So I know a lot of you uh, know that jewelry store in Boston. I used to service clocks for them, in fact, when I first started out. Um, uh, so they didn't make anything. You know, they were like Tiffany, where they would label good things and sell them in the store. On um, the movement of this clock, it says Ansonia Clock Company. 
because they were the maker of this style of clock. This essentially is like a bracket clock. They were called that because you know, originally there was a little shelf for the racket that they would stand on. So you put the bracket on the wall and this clock would sit on top of it. But mostly after a while, they would use it on tables or mantles. And this would, uh, this was a Westminster chime clock. Anything that has three winding bolts means that there's three machines inside, one for taking, one for striking the hours, and the third one for doing the Westminster chiming under four hours. So there's three main springs, three sets of gears uh, that are all working in tandem inside. And you have little dials here that can adjust the, uh, uh, the timekeeping rate, the slow fast, and also turn the chiming on and off too. Um, this typically gets worn because this is a silver dial, but you know, the silver ring is pretty Thing, you know, you can't scrape it off and get your kid's education. Uh, but there's only, but you often see it's worn out in certain places where somebody maybe has been getting it when they're winding the clock or or, or setting it to, so some of the silvering has come off. And if we make this an official kind of road show thing, well, you know, what's this worth? You know, like an, you know, like an fading when I hear this, uh, no one's going to think that this. These are pretty common. And, you know, at auction, this might sell for a couple hundred dollars. Because even though it's old, it's you know probably 110 years old, maybe uh, they made a lot of them. And of course, the value is determined by who wants to buy it and pay for it. And there aren't that many people that want to talk like this. Yes. Would a clock like that be um, If you don't want it to work, you would just keep boiling it. <laughs> but if you want it to work reliably, somebody like me needs to periodically take it apart. And deal with the dirt and the wear that's built up. Because the problem with continuing to oil a dirty clock is that you essentially you oil the dirt and dirt is an abrasive. So you uh, it starts, maybe it stopped because it dried up. So you said, well, let me just spray some WD in there or put oil in there. So all that grit you've now combined with oil again, and that grit starts to chew off the metal parts. So you can get away with it briefly, but um it, Jump oil blocks is not good. It's like it's like if you change the oil on your car and you don't change the filter, you know, it's kind of the same thing. But you know, nobody knows this unless they know it. And these clocks, you know, were so robust that they would run for decades without service. And then suddenly the thing would stop and they'd come to me, oh man, be, what's going on? This clock's been taking great for 50 years. But you will you know, try running your car for 50 years without changing the oil. You know, eventually it's gonna quit. It's a machine. There's nothing magic about it, but they take it personally like you know they did something wrong. The best one usually is it's the husband that breaks it. You know, exactly. oh, that's where it great until that guy wow, that doesn't work since. Um, but you know, there was their machines and they need periodic service the same way any other machine is. But the fact is, it's sort of a miracle that they work at all. I mean, name any other machine anywhere that's going 24 7 after 110 years. You know, there's nothing else in your house. And if you tell me somebody in the year 21, 22 is going to be using your vacuum cleaner or your dishwasher, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of amazing. I mean, let alone 200 years. I mean, that wooden movement is 200 years old and it would still work. So, you know, again, there's no reason to be mad at the clock when it quits after 40 years. Uh, you just, you know, realize that you need to get in service. Uh, this one I didn't look at. Uh, before I got here, but it's another tree crop and low, uh, similar to, uh, to they're sometimes called lancet style cases because they come up uh, to the point here. But I think I know what I'm going to see in the back here. Uh, yeah, I think this, yeah, this, I thought it was going to be a French movement, but this is also an American movement, but more designed to look like a French movement and like a French clock. Uh, but this is a with some extra inlaying too. But of course, all of you now know that since it only has two winding bubbles, it's just time to strike. There's no quarter hour music uh, that comes out of it. Uh, uh, so this would just uh, probably a single every half hour to let you know that the half hour of your life has gone by. Uh, and then it would count the hours too uh, when it gets to that point. So again, this. You know, they were very nice clocks. They were relatively expensive when they were new, but uh, you know, not particularly desirable or collectible now. So they still, again, it might be only a few hundred. You know, when I was in the clock selling business, Bill of Carnegie, uh, you know, told us all the 1800 clocks and watches. And I might have this one in an antique show, and I might have five or six hundred dollars on it. 
uh, but it would be because I've added the value of servicing the product and guaranteeing the returns. So that, you know, if you just buy it instead of auction, you know, for $200, then you're looking at another three or 400 to make it work when it doesn't, when you get it home. So you know, that, that was the, uh, the, the story there. So I've also brought down uh, a couple of the reference books that I use to any of the watches. There's big, thick, thick books like this. So if you came to me with the wall band pocket watch, I could tell you from the serial number when it was made. And, uh, and it's a watch with that end too. There's books like this, which actually reproduce and drop parts out of them. Now, we produce uh, uh, original factory catalogs. So almost every American club that's brought to me for repair, I can open up a book like this and show them the clock uh, from how it was originally advertised and what it cost back in whatever the year was. So it's great when someone brings me a clock, you know, especially some ornate thing. Let's see if I can quickly find one. Uh, some like, carved wooden thing. Uh, Let's see, they're sometimes called gingerbread clocks. You know, I sometimes I can't see that that well, but you know, these look fancy and everything. But once in a while, someone will come to me and, and bring me a clock and say, My grandfather made this clock, it's all hidden carved, you know, and it's beautifully made. And I said, Well, he must have made about 50,000. <laughs> I can show you this clock in a catalog. So, uh, I think eventually they understand that it has value even in the grandfather. Didn't spend a year carving it down the south. So, uh, and then uh, I just put two, and this is where I got that partial list of the Salem clock makers. It's just had just tens of thousands of American clock and watch makers in here. So, mostly if someone brings me an American clock uh, that isn't one of the big factory produced ones, I can still find a name in here. I certainly find Courier in here. I find uh, Daniel Ball in here. And you know, somebody, Clock guys tend to be a little obsessive sometimes, you know. So some people actually went to the trouble of finding all these guys and, and, and creating a book to make it easier for the next guys uh, to uh, to find clock makers. So that's one thing I like about horology is that a lot of people put a lot of research time into producing things like this, so you can know a lot about it. And often the makers weren't shy about putting the name on it either. You, know, you buy a piece of sandwich glass, you know, good luck knowing who made it when, this way or not, because, you know, it doesn't say big letters across the name. You know, whatever it is, you're finished, you know, made it, so it would have not fun. So it's, um, it's also fun for me and those readers because pretty often you can quickly identify who made it and then go to these resource books and, uh, and learn a whole lot about it uh, after it's too. So this is one of the uh, 800 plus books on clock, clocks and watches that uh, no was kind enough uh, to mention. I never met a clock book I do like, and they, they seem to like me too because I have long hours. So uh, I'm done, but I can certainly answer questions either uh, from the floor or uh, privately later. Uh, the only thing I ask usually by the time I'm done talking, all the cookies are gone. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so at least one cookie for me, uh, right? Uh, right. Yes, sir. When I was going to draw Shaw and Shaw, I had this little coffee watch. Yeah, it was cleaning out my farm's apartment and found this and it doesn't work. And I put it down to Google Street. Watch out in Cambridge. And this will cost you a block. So it has to be fixed. But I guess my question is Is there a history of pocket watches that was interesting as what we heard from these, or are they just too recent? No, I imagine that these were very popular when my grandfather's father was around. So yeah. you're saying that they could some kind of guys. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm more of a clock guy than a watch guy, but I certainly know a ton about watches too. And I could I could give a talk of, of the same way about this too, because uh there's a lot going on in a watch that's different than in the clock, and and there's the whole culture of it too, where uh you know, who owned them and why, and the progression they made, especially from being in England, mostly in France, to being mass produced in America and Switzerland. It, the fun thing, too, is that when, when Walton started manufacturing watches in bulk, uh, the choices people had were either expensive pocket watches from England or really crappy pocket watches from Switzerland. And everybody said, oh, switch watch, you know, it's like switch watch, you know, I have a Rolex, oh, you know, great, you know, Swiss watch. 
this most Swiss watches were junk at the time that all of them started up. They, for every three that they shipped to America, two never worked. And, and the third one, you know, no watchmaker could fix when it broke because, you know, they just were low quality. I mean, they were good Swiss watches too, but the bulk of them, they were mass produced there, you know, in a piecework kind of system again. So, and then people had pocket watches then, you know, in the roaring 20s and all, they wanted to be thinner, more spells, so they were thinner ones, but then it was really World War I where men became acceptable for men to wear wristwatches. And that led basically by the depression to the end of pocket watches for men uh, because they started to wear wristwatches. Before that, wristwatches were bracelet watches and women wore them. But too many guys, you know, got killed when they were, you know, checking their pocket watch in the trenches. You know, uh, they were deciding, you know, when it's time to jump out of the trench. So uh, they decided that maybe it was okay to wear a wristwatch. No one was going to, you know, uh, think that you were uh, a feminine by having a wristwatch because you at least you'd still be alive. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, that was a too long answer to your question. There's a lot going on there too. Um, those railroad watches are just beautiful. They're, they have jewels in them. You know, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, oh, it's a 17 jewel watch. And that's not to make it pretty. You know, it's not like they're in there so it'll sparkle and everyone will think you're wonderful. It's those jewels are in there as the bearings, the things that the shafts turned into, because the Swiss figured out in the 1700s that they could drill tiny holes in jewels like barnets or rubies, and that became the hole, the bearing that the gear would turn into. Because otherwise, you know, here essentially you drill a hole in the brass, and that's the hole that the gear turns in. And after a while, that hole gets more and bigger and bigger because it gets chewed up because Uncle Wendy has sprayed the WD-40 with it instead of cleaning it. And that happens in watches too. So and, and watches stuff, you know, are smaller and things are going faster, so they can chew them themselves up pretty fast. But if you can get a jewel like a ruby that's 10 times harder than brass or steel, and you can drill a hole in it, it can turn in there. Way less friction, so you don't need as big a spring. It's not going to wear as fast. You don't need as much oil because it's so smooth inside that jewel. So, you know, right? so the 70 jewel was sort of the standard for most of the bearings having jewels. But rare and great watches to have 23 jewels, 25 jewels. Sometimes, you know, I think this Rolex maybe has 27 or something because they jewel every place where things turn, you know, just to eliminate the wear and reduce the friction. So uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on and watchmakers and clockmakers were really like the smartest guys around, the ones that were making the things that were the most difficult to make. Because to make a little machine, you know, in the 1700s, you know, machine this big with gears in it that keeps time within even 10 minutes a day, you know, there was nothing else comparable that they were making that was so sophisticated and so difficult to make and so obvious when you made it wrong. You know, I guess, you know, you may have sword and the first time the guy hits you with a sword broken half, you know, you may be have an idea of him too if he wasn't any good. But, uh, you know, with watches, you know, there's no baloney, it works or it doesn't work. And it's, a, and it's an important story of, you know, of sort of industrial revolution too. And, you know, so many other trades and crafts grew out of watchmaking and clockmaking because they sort of showed how precision machine could be done to then make other things that were equally complex and equally important to uh, society. Well, another long answer. <laughs> Anybody want a short answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you kind of really by saying, watches are so popular, but now it's all digital. Yeah. So this is, you know, kind of the end of the, of the road, the clocks. It really, yeah. Um, well, I guess the pendulum is swinging, you know, because uh, I mean, there's still people that do it, and there's, you know, there's the steampunk people, you know, the like, oh, there's a lot of stuff, and, you know, they take the gears and make a hat out of them. But some of them actually make them clocks. And encouraging to me is, you know, there still are big clock and watch auctions. There's one happening November 20th in New Hampshire, where there's probably 2,000 antique clocks for sale. 
all of them will be sold. Some of them will sell for thousands of dollars. So they're still collectors, but you're right, it's the wristwatches. You know, some Wall Street guys, you know, that they have 10 Rolexes, you know, they collect them and they meet and brag about the watches they have. You know, just within the last two days, I got two big things. Watch collector magazines, you know, what's the new, you know, Panic Fleet, what's the new Audemars, you know, and, I mean, they're great, they're beautiful, they're incredibly, you know, precise mechanical machines. So there's, there's a lot of people that appreciate the fact that, you know, on their wrist, they still have sort of a highly refined mechanical thing. You know, you open up your iPhone and you just close it and you, you don't know what's happening there, you can't see the electrons. But you open up the watch, you know, there's actually something turning, you know, something moving, and you sort of can figure out how it's working in there. So I think there's still a fascination for mechanical things. You know, I speak to school kids sometimes, and, you know, in a group of 10, there's maybe two that you, know, you give them a clock like this to look at, and they won't give it that. Oh, yeah. This is cool. You know, the other one are getting out of here. This guy's crazy. But, um, you know, but there are certain people that are just drawn to mechanical things. Uh, the smartest people, of course. That's the dollar to know. You can keep looking at their iPhones. But uh, so I think there's hope, and I, and I see signs of increasing hope that some people even. Under 80, you know, let's go think these things are pretty cool. And it's almost like it's almost it's so old that it's new to people. You know, almost like 30 years ago, oh, that's grandma, that old clock, you know, that piece of junk. I never want to see that again. But like now the next generation is like, wow, I've never seen anything like that. Is that great grandma's? You know, I don't want that. So, you know, I think uh, then again, then there's hope. Um, you all are here, which I appreciate. So uh, maybe that's cool too. Uh, I'm already out. Anybody else? Are you ready? Oh, Spencer? Uh, I was just wondering is the um, grandfather clock control based clock or like, are they um, synonyms? Yes, they are. Okay. Yes. Uh, but even, I mean, there's pure, as we say, even tall case clock, you know, that, you know, that's like redundant because if it's a tall clock, it's a case clock. You know, so the terminology is fuzzy, and there's people who, you know, will complain if you don't call it by the right name. But I think the point of language is to let people know what you're talking about. So I think, you know, no one's confused if you say call it. But, but, you know, I suppose if you work at Winterter, you know, and that's a you know, conservator there, and you said grandfather clock, you know, they hand you your pink uh, slip. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I got a little story for you. I have a granddaughter. She called her garage on the truck. She just told me that there's a crank to rule the window down. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. This was great. And all that they're not. They're trying to stop it. Actually, something happens and something else happens. Yeah. Oh, that's good too. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit more about the father of Mass production. His name was Eli somebody. Eli Terry. 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 T E R R Y. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Uh, yes, because he was. Uh, he started out making, you know, a few clocks at a time, uh, but also still out of wood because again, breath was expensive. So he was a clock maker of movements. But he was, he you know, got a contract with uh, two cousins, the Porter, people thought they were brothers, but they weren't, uh, who were essentially investors, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. And he, he the two, those two Porter guys, that there was the famous Porter contract in 1803, I think, whatever the year was, where they essentially commissioned him and they gave him the, the startup money to build this factory where he made, uh, and a lot of they looked sort of crude, as a machinery, but essentially instead of one guy taking one year at a time and cutting it out, they could arrange like a whole row of blanks on an axle and run the slip saw down them and, you know, and index it around and, choom, 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 and cut, you know, the 30 teeth or whatever it was in that year and pull them off that shaft. And they were all identical. And then, you know, the women sitting at those benches could just put these clocks together and every part would work to get the other part. So he, he was the innovator. Uh, it's sort of a common story in American uh, business where the guy that worked for him, Seth Thomas, 
um, bought Altair and ended up making like 50 times more money than the guy that invented it. Uh, but because he was more of a businessman, set it on, so he's a case maker. He wasn't a clock maker to begin with, but he took that whole factory production system to the next steps and next steps. And really, you know, more and more mass production. But Terry did find you know, he was rich and he you know, was philanthropic and all that. So it was, and he had offspring that were also in the business that did a lot of innovation. So, uh, and he was an important guy. And again, this was all water power. So you needed to be by the stream. And in the winter, maybe when the stream froze, uh, he found something else to do. But uh, that quarter contract was just a pivotal moment in American industry because it proved that you know, factory production uh, could work for, for producing machinery. So this was in the early 1800s in Connecticut? Yes. Yes, in the, in the Waterbury, Bristol area. There's a wonderful museum in Bristol called the American Clock and Watch Museum that has hundreds of uh, clocks like this and, and watches and also some of the machine but there's actually one of uh one of the machines there that uh, terry produced and there were templates too so that was another important innovation was that some of the parts are round you know they have uh, specific shapes and if the shape is wrong it doesn't work so they were you know, templates so that was unusual too instead of just sort of figuring out or copying the one you just made you hope it works you know, these were templates so they could stamp them, cut them quickly, and everyone would be perfect and would be the same. So that was another part of the innovation in the uh, Connecticut Historical Society in Hartford. There's a lot of those blanks and templates from really Connecticut production, too. You know, in a drawer, where you see that, you know, they, they figured it out. And, you know, before that, there were other people doing it by hand and, you know, making 20, 50, 100 parts a day, you know, by working dawn to dusk until the sun went down. But if you just throw the switch on the machine and it spits out 500 of them an hour, you know, the thing's going to be cheaper and the parts are going to be better, actually, too. Thank you, Bob. That was wonderful.